Lily and White and Light Up, all of which take you one step closer to that feeling of hope. I am your co-host, Neil Turetti. Hi, everyone, and I am your co-host, Mimi O'Day. And today we have the pleasure of welcoming Somatic Coach, who's helped people around the world reconnect with their intuition through somatic body-based work and reach peak levels of the self of self-compassion. Uh, easy for me to say. Today we have <laughs> Marina <laughs> Yanai Schreiner with us. Hi, Marina. Welcome to our show. Hi. Hi, Marina. It's a pleasure. We are just so yeah. excited because this is my favorite all-time topic. It really is. I, since yeah. the, uh, how do you say it? Somatic therapy? The big yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. That is my favorite topic. So you and I, are gonna, three of us are going to have a great conversation on that because I think people really need to know. So, yes. I'm gonna, sweetie, can you tell us about your background and your childhood? Because you moved around to different countries, didn't you? You had frequent immigration kind of thing. Yes. Was it a military deal or? No, no, no. So I was born in Ukraine, and my family was always really into just finding the best life for themselves. And so they decided oh. to move from Ukraine to Israel as soon as communism allowed it. Um, and we moved to Israel, and then again, it was hot, it was stressful, um, there was violence going on, and so they decided to move to the U.S. Um, so yeah, lots of moving, and now I moved to Costa Rica, so I've been moving a lot. Anyway, so <laughs> I know you that so many people in this who work, seek to who work to help people, yourself, coaches, therapists, counselors, are trauma informed, uh, and we've been hearing that a lot, especially with a lot of our guests. So first, can you go into what does that mean for the layman who who may not be in that field of therapy or coaching? What does it mean to be trauma-informed, and how can all of us who are not coaches or counselors be more trauma-informed, especially to help friends and family members around us who are going through troubles because of trauma? Of course, we all are in our own ways, right? We all have trauma, which we'll get into. But, yeah, go into that. What does that mean, and how can we all be more trauma-informed? I love this question. Thank you for asking it, especially for, like, friends and family and, you know, um, so basically, as a coach, it's the understanding that if someone wants something, like they really want to create something in their life, they have this goal, blah, 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 and then they just keep getting stuck, they can't reach it for whatever reason. The reason is, typically, if they've tried a lot of things in terms of like strategy and, you know, the, the practical parts of it, where they're getting stuck is this trauma piece. So it's like it creates a lot of compassion because then you realize this person is not lazy, they're not bad, they are just, they have pieces of the path that they haven't processed that are impacting this goal, but it's also impacting every area of their life. And in terms of, you know, friendships and family, it's so funny because even when I moved here to Costa Rica and I would tell friends and my family, oh, it's beautiful here and I love it but like a lot of stuff is coming up for me and I'm feeling really stressed and I'm feeling all these emotions and they'll be like but why you chose to move there it was your choice right and like but why nothing's bad outside I mean it's like you said it's beautiful and everything seems great and I have you know a place to live and I have a car and like everything seems great but that is really that dissonance and it's so tricky for people because it's like, how do you talk about, how do you explain that? It's in your body, it's in your nervous system, it's in your emotions, it's not in your head. It's not that you're consciously creating that stuckness or those emotions, it's very unconscious. Well, you yeah. sort of just answered my, my next, our next question is, um, can you talk about trauma being more about response to something? and not so much the actual event. And what would be a good example of that? Yes. So anything's an example for that, of that, because like Neil said, he said, how can we help people who have trauma? And then he was like, well, don't we all? And yes, we do. Um, and we forget that. So we tend to like put people in box, like, oh, this person's really traumatized. You know, let's help them. 
And, and I kind of used to see myself that way because I have concrete examples of things that if, you know, if you heard them, you'd be like, of course, you're traumatized from this thing. Um, however, in addition, it's really not about the event. It's about the amount of resources that we have to handle it. So here's like a really amazing example that uh, Peter Levine writes about in his book, which is these kids, and this is a real story. These kids were trapped underground by someone, and most of them uh, were just in shock. So they were just sitting there in shock, didn't know what to do. And then one of the kids, for whatever reason, maybe he was prepared for this situation in some way. Maybe he was emotionally you know, more supported in his house. And he started to dig his way out. And that kid who dug his way out did not have any PTSD symptoms years later. And all of the other kids did. So I think that's a really beautiful example to show you, like they were all in the same situation. One of them was not traumatized. So he experienced this event and it did not register as trauma for his nervous system because he had enough resources internally and externally, maybe he was strong as well, um, to use that survival energy that we all have. Because we all have that energy because we're all meant to do our best to survive all the time. And sometimes you might feel like, I don't have the emotional capacity right now. I don't have the physical capacity. And so I, I get stuck. I shrink in the situation. It could be something super simple, like my boss is yelling at me, or you know, like like something that doesn't seem traumatic, but then your body, the way it responds, the way you freeze, the way you feel helpless, that registers as Marina, well. that is so perfect. Listen to your body. Your body will tell you. But Neil, I'm gonna jump in here real quick, okay? Because she had mentioned these kids and you know, yeah. some having trauma and whatnot. Last night I watched the movie 13 Lives. Uh, Ron Howard um, directed it. Anyway, these, these 13, 12 kids and their coach were trapped. Do you remember this? They were trapped in uh, Thailand in that cave mm. for like 20 days. Do you know that their coach taught them meditation? So they came out so far without trauma. Yeah, and you know, it's so funny. My mom was telling me about that like a couple of days ago that she watched that and she was just so amazed by it. it's their their experience and the way they responded to what was happening. It's so beautiful. You and know, then, we talk about our response to certain things and how we react and like you mentioned, finding those resources from within us to to help with that. And I remember years ago when I started going to therapy for clinical depression and I didn't even know or recognize at the time certain events in my life that were traumatic until I did an introspection and my counselor really helped me. So how do we go about for those kind of things if we don't even know like some of the things that are traumatic to us or they're non obvious like you just you mentioned a little bit earlier on some of them may not even be that obvious so how do we learn to recognize that is it introspection is it talking to a professional or how do we go about that process yeah so the, the interesting kind of funny thing is i believe that most of us don't recognize it not just because maybe they are not obvious things like other people would say that doesn't sound so traumatic, maybe. Sometimes it's obvious things, but we're so used to it. Like it's our life, it's our childhood, it's, right? And it's just like, yeah, that's, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with that because that was your experience. That's all you knew. And little kids, it's really interesting. They often blame themselves because that is also a survival strategy. Because if you were to see that there's something wrong with your caregivers, that's really, really scary. Like, that's dangerous. So it's like, okay, maybe I can do this and this better. Or, and so that's also like one of the sources of trauma. So the beautiful thing about somatic work is you don't have to know the story. That's what I love about it. And in my work, I definitely love combining approaches. So I don't only do the body-based approach. I also talk to my clients. I also kind of, if there is a thread, I help them kind of connect the dots because that is also really 
kind of like validating. I'm sure it was. I mean, I'm assuming it was for you, Neil, when you kind of kind of connected those dots of yeah. how you are now and right in the past. Um, so it's it's really in the body where you know I can give you an example of like I have a client who really wanted a boyfriend who would do certain things, and then the moment it happened, he's freaking out. He's freaking out. She's like, he's wrong, he's bad, and here are all the reasons, like, here's what's wrong with him. And she, because we had worked together for a long time, she, she really recognized, she was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I mean, I get it. Like, she recognized the dissonance. She didn't take it for granted of, like, you know, he is really bad. She was like, I know he's not. I know I'm creating this story because, because of my past. Um, so that kind of gives you clues. Your body gives you clues in like the constriction that you feel, the uh, the sensations in your body, like a lot of heaviness, constriction, tightness in the body. That is just tells you the whole story in each situation. You know, when I got here, I kind of connected to how lonely I was an only child, first of all, and just different circumstances, how emotionally lonely I felt my whole life being new in this situation you know so it's really really interesting to notice our bodies just being constricted being heavy being tight and that starts to tell us a story uh, okay. well great. we're getting into my favorite favorite subject <laughs> because i want to talk about the polynagal theory okay uh, but not 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 specifically the different states of it, like uh, ventral vagal and vagal. ventral vagal, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sympathetic <laughs> dorsal, etc. Uh, can you explain those states? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah. we have three three basic states, and this is the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic comes from automatic. So this is really important because it's like not something you control it's meant for survival so i like to explain that to my clients and i love educating my clients as well i'm not just coaching them because it's you need those states like you need anxiety because if a feed comes and you're like hi hello you know like you need to have that response of fight or flight which is a sympathetic that's the activation the up Upness, you know, of our nervous system, fight or flight could also look like being really angry and reactive. And again, when you hear this, think about when does your response match the situation and when does it not match the situation? And that really gives you the clue of are you reacting out of trauma or are you just responding to the situation in a, in a way that makes sense? So if a burglar comes, and you are going to fight or flight, that's very good, <laughs> right? And you're mm -hmm. running away or you're fight, fighting the, the mm -hmm. burglar. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the second one is the dorsal, the collapse, the hopelessness, the helplessness. And that is what we call preparation for death in polyvagal theory, because if you are being, um, if an animal or us, we're also animals, um, if we're threatened and we feel like we cannot escape and we cannot fight, then we will go into this numbness collapse so that we don't feel what it's like to be killed if we are killed. So it's actually really a smart oh. system. Yeah. Wow. It's a really, it's a really smart system. The trouble uh -huh. is we do this in a way that often that doesn't match the situation. And, and you know, the first one is also, uh, when we're regulated, which is called um, ventral vagal which is when we're present and curious. We're not necessarily like super, super happy and high on life, but we're just, we're present. Present to all of our emotions, our experience. We feel like we can respond and, and deal with it. So that's, yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. I find it really fascinating also, really. Okay, and, can I, and I just had a friend tell me that if you rub right here, this is, what is this here? Yeah. Yeah, so right this there. is yeah. the, the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve the starts vagus nerve. at, yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a really yeah. long cranial nerve and it goes all, it starts in, you know, in the cranial area and then it goes all the way through all your organs in your body 
And that's why, you know, a lot of people deal with digestive issues and things like that, because it's all connected. Your emotions and your digestion are all connected through the vagus nerve and other systems as well. Yeah, there are yeah. many exercises like that. The, the biggest thing, and every person just can find what works for them. It can even be being in water or you know, this recently, this is what I've been loving, being in water or holding the bottoms of my feet. Um, things like, oh. there's many, many things that really? basically the goal of them is to help you feel safe, to help your body realize that you're actually not in danger, that you're safe. And the most important part is that you can actually feel the sensations in your body of safety. You're not just like, I am safe. I am sitting in this pool and everything's okay because it's your body. Again, it's not just up here. It's not just in your mind understanding because we consciously understand. But in the situations where we are overreacting, the unconscious feels like we are threatened. And to our body, it's the same. So if there's a burglar or not, it's the same thing. It's the same experience. So we have to actually ground that in the body and the sensations like in the openness in our chest or this lightness in our body and all the energy kind of going down things like that so you know your generation i feel like at that time there was a lot of survival threat going on at least from my mm -hmm. family like it was yeah. real survival stuff and you know for immigrants and it's just there was so much upheaval um and you'll notice that whenever we encounter any survival type stuff like covid even you know it's like there's a oh, COVID screwed up a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there's, a, there's this in the background, this perception that, okay, there's threats. There are looming threats somewhere. And we don't even know what it is or what it looks like. And we don't understand it, which is the worst, because we want to understand. We want to know. We want mm -hmm. predictable things. And that's where our whole nervous system is activated. It gets more activated because it's like threat, threat. And your nervous system can, can carry three generations of trauma. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff in your nervous system to work out. Yeah. <laughs> Listen Become to Marina, friends. guys. Yeah. Become friends with your nervous system because it ain't going to help having it as an enemy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, another aspect of that i know this is something you talk a lot about because i've you know watched in preparation for this i saw a lot of your other podcast appearances and interviews and i know one of the things that you're big on is talking about one thing that we do wrong right is because going into the habit of transferring the process of smoothing our emotions to someone else can be destructive right that's why i know you talk about that a lot but also right it's a natural thing for human beings, right? We want to seek out love and support from others and acceptance as well around society, friends, family, even like the most self-confident people I know tend to do that. So how do we differentiate between those two feelings? Like we're looking for love and support, which we not only want, but we need as well in life. Obviously we need family and friends and love around us, but not get to the point of approval and dependence. And where does that line, like, where, where does that line uh, appear about those two things? Support versus complete dependence of smoothing our emotions. You guys ask the best questions, I just want to say. Um, I love your question. So I think what you're getting into is attachment sex. And basically, attachment styles are like how we survive in terms of relationships. How do we show up to relationships? How do the relationships that we had when we were little with important people in our lives, like caregivers, but also other important people, how do those impact how we show up now in the relationship? And it's all kind of connected. It's like polyvagal theory and attachment styles are connected because essentially we have kind of three pathways of regulation. So we have three pathways of how to regulate our nervous system. And what that means is a regulated nervous system is not a nervous system that is always in ventral. Like it's not a nervous system that's always peaceful because again, we need to go into the other space in, for survival. So a regulated nervous system spends less time 
moving between being activated and coming back into being regular. So that, that mm -hmm. time is like, it's being strong. And so how do we do that? How do we regulate the nervous system? There are three pathways. The first one is called, oh, and they're not in a particular order, and we need all of them. And we also, uh, kind of the access that we have to all of them um, and to these choices, these three like choices, is important. And it answers your question. So I'll come back to it. So basically, the first one, auto-regulation, is like going for a walk, watching TV, eating something, kind of like it's, some of it is a little bit like numbing, some of it is distracting, and some of it is just like, okay, I just need to do something, I need to move myself, and then I feel better. And we need that. The second one is call regulation, which is what you're speaking to here, which is like, I am sad or I'm angry, and then there's a person near me that's like, I'm here, I'm just holding space for you, just like feel that emotion. And then I become regulated. And the third one is self-regulation, which is where, you know, the different techniques, feeling our emotions, uh, being in water, feeling our sadness, our anger, and letting it move through, and then coming back to present. And essentially, like, someone who is securely attached, so has kind of, like, healthy attachment, is someone who's able to call a friend for support, and if the friend is unavailable, they're like, it's okay, I can also, I can deal with this, like, it's fine. So I kind of have access to everything. Like, I have all the choices that are on the table. And a lot of people that I work with, and myself included, I'm working on this a lot, um, maybe we over-rely on one of these things, right? So maybe we're, like, very, very reliant on ourselves. We're like, I can deal with this. I don't need anyone. It's fine. Um, or I just, like, totally avoid my emotions. Totally avoid, like, it's fine. I'm going to work. I'm going to watch TV. It's all good. So that's the more avoidant attachment style. And then those of us who are like, I need you to help me. I'm desperate. You know, like, friend, I can't survive. That's the more anxious attachment style. So, and it's a continuum. And in different situations, we might act differently. Um, but those are, that's kind of what that looks like. That's, that was amazing. So that was my, actually, that was my question. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's what? basically, to sum that up, you're saying it's good to have options, like make sure to, to avoid that. We can say, okay, well, yes, this, this particular friend of mine always cheers me up, picks me up, but if they're not there for us when we need them, that's okay. We have other options available to us, is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. okay. That We're going to, this, yeah. We didn't, we didn't, Neil and I didn't talk about this, but I want to talk about anger and what anger does to your uh, polynervous system and how you would recommend dealing with it. Because at times, like you said, you get angry at your boss and you want to say something, but you probably shouldn't, right? <laughs> you probably, do you just walk away? Do you go find a corner? You know, do you go? <laughs> sit in a corner, what would you recommend? So it's funny, but even in the somatic world, we tend to avoid emotions because I guess, I guess we all just want to avoid emotions as humans, we just don't <laughs> want to deal with them. I've had to oh, learn ever. a lot. Yes. I've had to learn I'm a, a lot about it. Okay. Um, yeah. I, won't, I yeah. don't confront. I take off. Mm -hmm. And that's really good that you know that about yourself. Like it's good information, right? So emotions are information and energy. That's all that they are, information and energy. And so We're I had energy. to learn from scratch. Yeah, exactly. Um, I had to learn this from scratch because I was definitely not taught anything about emotions at any point in my life. <laughs> I just like avoided the subject. Mm -hmm. And I've only seen very toxic expressions of emotions. And so anger, I believe, now is super important and really, really great. And it's, it's information. What does the information say? My boundary has been crossed. My needs are not being met. Something's happening. I need to tend to it. How do I tend to it? Do I just scream at the person? No. So basically what I believe about anger is it's my anger and no one gets to take it away or give it to me. Like it is mine. 
So when I feel oh, I angry, love that. I, I can just go and move it, move that energy that I have. I can scream. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can hit pillows. Mm -hmm. I can push the wall. And I do this with my clients a lot. And it's a big process because a lot of them are like, I feel guilty. I feel bad. I'm a violent person. And, I, and so it's like kind of like the process of, first of all, what did you learn about anger when you were a kid? And second of all, you're going to be a violent person if you don't release anger in this way. Like, like and releasing anger on your own towards the pillow or the wall basically makes space in your body to then say, okay, now I'm calm and still I feel that my needs are not met in this situation. I'm going to go talk to this person really nicely versus like either being like passive aggressive or just like screaming mm -hmm. at them, right? I love that, yeah. What would you say in today's day and age, some tips for parents to be aware of their children's emotional needs? Because I, I know large part of that, a lot of people talk about this, is where it goes, like you said, generational trauma, sometimes in the womb, sometimes when they're babies, if they're crying, and the parent is not intentionally ignoring them, right? They could be busy or caught up. So in this day and age, when we, when we have all this information to learn, if we choose to imbibe it, what would you say is there certain tips to parents to take more care of their children's emotional needs? So first I will say like, I am not an expert on kids. I don't have kids yet. I am so not a kid expert. So I love working with parents about their triggers and then how they actually talk to their kids is not my expertise. So I'm just gonna address like the way that I work with parents and I have lots of clients who are parents and I want to give like a really good example. One of my clients, um, she basically came to me and was like, you know, I had all these amazing plans for the summer for my kids. And I was like, really, really excited. It's going to be, it's going to be a family summer. You know, it's going to be awesome. And then just one of my kids was just constantly angry and shut down, angry and shut down. Like going, and it was so triggering. And I was like, so angry with him for being this way. And at the same time, I was like really feeling guilty that I was angry at my kid and this whole cycle. And so basically from knowing her really well, I was like, well, what did you want in your childhood in the summer? And she was like, that, this plan, this plan that I have for my kids, which is, you know, a peaceful family summer. And I'm like, yeah, and you're not getting it now. You're not getting mm -hmm. it. So you yep. need to grieve it. Don't take it out on them, but uh -huh. you have to mm -hmm. grieve your childhood, like that's what's happening. It's just being reflected to you that you need to grieve, that you didn't have that. You never got that. You always got actually anger from your parents, which is what be in your son right now, which is triggering you, but he's allowed to be angry. He's allowed to have his anger, right? But it's triggering you because it's literally like a picture of what your childhood was through your child. And so like, yeah. I just see that a lot in my clients where their kids, trigger them to their own step. And it's really like, I mean, I'm sure it's really hard. I feel that with friends and partners and other people, but with your kids, you know, they're like there 24 seven and you have to take care of them. It's a lot, but basically how I see like being a conscious parent is they're triggering something in you and you pay attention to you. Don't, don't blame them, but actually blame your parents, you know, kind of, grieve and raise at your parents rather than your kids and and that's where the healing comes uh, you and i we we share a common trait and that is it triggers over the fear of abandonment right i've read into that and i know of course yours was uh, or at least a large part of yours was i know the story of passed down from your grandmother and her time in labor camp when she was two years old so knowing that, and you, I know the story of you talking to her and knowing that story and finally figuring it out, okay, this is why I feel the way I feel. Do you still have those triggers and fears where if something happens? And if so, what do you do? And of course, I'm, and by that, I mean, what should I do? <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. And, you know, I think that people expect that they're going to do this work and then they're just not going to have any more triggers like they're just going to be fine yeah. they're going to be happy yeah. all the time no, but no, that, no, no. that's not going to happen uh we're going to continue probably having the same triggers we're just going to develop a way 
a new way to be with them. And I will add, you're not going to like this meal, possibly. But um, it's also interesting how it's kind of unraveled because I used to think that it was only about my drama. And now I'm understanding that it was also like more emotional abandonment for my parents because they just didn't know how I'm very sensitive. And they had no idea, and they are also actually very sensitive, both of them, but they had no idea how to support me at all emotionally. So they kind of just were through, like, they were like, good luck, <laughs> we don't know what to do, this is too much, okay. And so that's, you know, some of that really painful stuff that if I feel like someone, like, if my partner, I perceive that he's, like, emotionally unavailable for a second, I'm just like, <gasps> it's here, you know, that, that. Fear. Yeah. So good. That. Yeah. 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 So what I do is I take that as an opportunity to really grieve. I mean, I have literally said the words in my head and I was like, ah, what's happening? I want my mommy. And I was like, how old am I? But it's there. It's the truth. It's like, I don't want my partner. I want my mom. Like, that's what, what I'm feeling in that moment. So I actually take the time to grieve that. And to really, when, when I cry, I think about those times in my childhood when I felt really alone, um, instead yeah. of like focusing all my attention on what's happening right now, because I know that that's not actually what I'm crying about. Um, and then, and then you know, and the other emotions, maybe like fear or rage, like whatever's coming kind of like crosses that. Um, sometimes it's also about getting angry that you're still having that trigger, like that, that Sometimes, you know, whatever emotion's coming up, just, like, let it be there. Like, really allow it to be there. Have, if you, if it helps you. I, sometimes I imagine that someone is supporting me. It can be someone I know or, like, an imaginary person, but I just imagine them kind of having their hand on my back and being, like, it's okay that you're crying. It's okay that you're angry. It's all okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. Just keep going. It's perfect. Or I'll ask my partner to just like hold space. I'll be like, don't say anything. I don't need you to fix it. Just be here. And I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to let her all out. And then I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's, uh, I love that. that awesome. like, if, I'm wondering if, if this effective, because this is something I do too, is you said mm -hmm. like sometimes you imagine that person supporting you what i tend to do is look at like previous texts or messages that friends send me that were positive like because i always take screenshots whenever something good happens to me it's my way of sort of looking back and saying okay it happened once it did so would that Am I on the right track of doing that? I'll, I'll sometimes look at old texts and say, oh, this person, my friend texted me the nicest, warmest message, and it made me feel good at the time. So let me look back at it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. I mean, what, what works for you is what works for you. I would just say, you said it made you feel really good at that time. Like, really feel that. You know, like, feel what it's like to be supported. And actually let yourself, allow yourself to feel supported, to feel loved when you're in the text. I cry. I'm a crier. And I'm not, I'm not sorry about that. Because after I have a good cry, I feel so much better. So guys don't cry. Maybe if they did a little. <laughs> Because of preconceived notions, they guys tend to hide it. We all do. Human beings all cry. It's it's uh, it's a natural emotion. You have it's to. Yeah. Emotion yeah. as well, but it's yeah. yeah there's this preconceived notions of society makes certain people hide it, whereas mm -hmm. other people do more openly. I think mm -hmm. that's the difference. Exactly. Exactly. And I so, just uh, I just read the most amazing thing. Sorry. I just wanted to mention I no. the most amazing thing. Um, I remember her, her account. She's a therapist, but she she was writing about how actually tears hold stress hormones. So when we cry, we we're actually like releasing stress hormones and letting them go. And that's why after you feel so good and I know I relate mm -hmm. to men because I am really good with anger, but like sadness is still like tricky. So I really relate to that struggle of, of how to cry. And when I do, it's the best thing. I'm just like so happy and I feel such relief. 
Wow. And not that anybody cares, but this is something else I do. I get in the shower and I make the water kind of colder than hotter because it kind of like, you know, keeps you, you know, that. and I let it run down my back and I, and I picture all that stress just, you know, moving out of my body and going down the drain. So, you know, after 10 minutes when I'm, you know, ready to get out of the shower, I'm like, okay, you know, that felt really good. Like you said, water. I love that. That's, I love that. And hey, kiddo, can you tell us where everybody can find you? Like your social media and, you know, your website so we can get you some people that come and, you know. <laughs> yes. Go to Costa Rica. Is... <laughs> I work with people on Zoom, so I actually work with people from all over the world, which is nice. Um, That's great. Yeah. Instagram, marina.y.t. Okay. Easy. How about that. anything on Twitter? Are you on Twitter? No, no. I am trying Just to I get my. Don't okay. you for that. <laughs> it's getting to be really a chore to be on there these days. Yeah, yeah. it is. I mean, I yeah. have mentally, I have mentally shut down from Twitter, and I have a lot of friends that I love and adore that are missing me, and they send me notes of. Um, you know, uh, you know, just feel better. But mental mental health is a, like my mental health is not for some reason allowing me to go on Twitter right now. And yeah, I'm missing my friends. Listen yeah, but you know, when I'm better, I'll. I mean, when it, you know, when I feel like I can, I'll be back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I love that. Well, this yeah. has been oh amazing, Marina. You okay. have you yeah. really have taught us. A lot, and um, awesome. you know, it's, it's a I, episode for me, really. Yeah, you know, and enjoy. Yeah. We enjoyed you. Okay, it's, me too. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And Marina, this is one of my favorite shows. I can't wait to watch it. I hope everyone has a fantastic day. Be sure to hit like on this video and subscribe to this channel so you never miss an episode. Thank you, everyone, once again, and we will see you right here next.